Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Andy from uh, VML Lionart, and I'm joined today uh, by Malcolm Pinkerton from uh, Kantar. Uh, the two of us are, are leading a, a webinar today called DDC DNA. Uh, it's a game of two halves we have for you. We're introducing a book that we collaborated on called DDC DNA. You can see the cover of that here at the start. Um, Malcolm's going to kick us off by providing market context um, and really, you know, an oversight and overlook into the new rules of customer engagement and the new opportunities to do that. And then I'm going to return and for the second part of uh, our, our webinar, I'm going to take you on a whist whistle stop tour through the book that we collaborated on, um, which really aims to uncover the true DNA of DDC brands. So for the moment, I'm going to hand over to uh, Malcolm and then I'll join again shortly. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Andy. It's great to be with you all today. And um, so, as Andy said, uh, I'm going to kick us off um, looking through a little bit about the state of change in commerce and some of the key drivers uh, and what that really means for brands and how we're seeing those, those drivers manifest in retail. And um, one of the things that's becoming incredibly apparent is that the pace of change is accelerating. And that's really thanks to the likes of Alibaba. They are beginning to create very fast Eco, retail ecosystems, and they're beginning to really shake up every single aspect of consumers' lives and lifestyles. And they're beginning to create entirely new consumer models that's beginning to completely revolutionize how we all shop. But it's not just the likes of Alibaba. Facebook as well is really rapidly evolving from a social network to a fully integrated ecosystem, even with its own cryptocurrency. And this will not only fundamentally change how we can create and convert demand through new and innovative content marketing, but it will ultimately change how and where we actually purchase. But we're also seeing the continued evolution of the mobile as the ultimate shopping and lifestyle companion. And because of this, we're beginning to see the rise of what we're calling the super app. These are all encompassing on demand, retail as a service, ecosystems, in the palm of your hand. And this is beginning to create micro moments. And it's really, really beginning to create new ways to hyper target, target the consumer and encourage those in moment purchasing. So that instant gratification is only going to accelerate. But we're also beginning to see the battle for this sort of share of consumers' wallets, home, lifestyle is only really just beginning. And that is really far, far more than just simply the Internet of Things. It's the creation of complete retail operating systems, and that's granting consumers frictionless access to retailers and brands. And in many instances, thanks in the main to the likes of Google, creating a level playing field with businesses both large and small. So really all this together collectively means that we're rapidly approaching the next era of commerce. And that's moving way beyond omnichannel to focusing on truly consumer centric experiences. And that's a really important message to get across because we're not really talking about channel centricity anymore. We're talking about true consumer centric experiences. And the prerequisite to success is moving far, is moving forward to create seamlessly online and or offline through agile and fully connected retail networks. And moving forward, outperforming brands will be defined by the ability to constantly redefine and reinvent for new missions and occasions, almost redefining commerce by creating those seamless experiences across diverse channels while making more meaningful connections with the consumer. And doing this really requires or looking to create those consumer centric experiences requires significantly expanding our view of who the consumer is. We often just focus on our great customers or our good customers, but we need to ensure we're where the consumers are, not necessarily where we expect or want them to be. So we have to begin to really expand the view of who our consumers are and where they are and how we need to engage, interact and enable them to shop. Now this requires, of course, ensuring that everybody in the business knows absolutely everything about the consumer and the consumer journey. And this is only really possible through the effective and efficient use of data driven insights. So we often talk about big data or big 
extracting micro data from big data, but essentially it is about leveraging data and engaging in compelling genuine conversations via social platforms and considering how your ability to extract that meaningful insights from the data you harness from your consumers. And importantly, knowing who actually owns that data because it's only going to be through joining up all the dots to create that truly holistic view of the consumer will it be possible to implement the solutions that drive anything close to the levels of experiential commerce that we begin to expect. But of course, while of extracting valuable insights from our data uh, and can be collated and collected from multiple touch points, it's also about ensuring you gain more meaningful and relevant closer relationships with the consumer and driving brand loyalty and conversion is going to be very important uh, triggers for this. Brands will need to build those stronger connections with the consumer in more meaningful and relevant ways. And this is a great example from uh, the runway it was a new balance uh, where you can only buy beer or drinks in the pub through, uh, through running uh, and the, uh, the bonuses that you gain from doing physical activity. So if we start to really consider how we can completely reframe the category and focus on appealing to the consumer's values, their life and their lifestyle, it's not about focusing on the product, but expanding the reach of a brand to increase awareness, consideration and conversion. And this is where we can start to look at creating um, D2C solutions that enable brands to focus on delivering those unique solutions and services aimed at the great consumers, while leveraging the data harness to inform retail partners of the opportunities and trends available. This enables the brand to build a closer and more meaningful relationships with the consumer while maintaining those all important existing retailer relationships. So in this example, using the principles of D2C mindset, Gatorade has brought distinctive value to the marketplace by creating product bundles that are not only unique to the environment, but are highly valuable to their target market. The site also addresses the casual athlete and sports fans with the new bundles, giftable sets, and a complete range of products that can't be found anywhere else. And their subscription capabilities ensures they lock the consumer in to their own ecosystem. But it's also becoming incredibly important to remove any pain points or friction points for the consumer to make it easy, but no less uh, enjoyable. And that's why it's becoming far more important for consumers uh, to receive the, op the opportunity to have auto replenishment and subscription models are becoming an incredibly important solution to the consumers, especially in their choice of where they shop. But brands should be embrace these types of solutions that be mindful of how they ensure they're selected and interrupt if they're not. But we're also seeing consumers looking at simplicity and speed and convenience is therefore being completely redefined. We're seeing the proliferation of on-demand and ride-hailing businesses, and that's escalating retail as a service, especially in those all important emerging markets where growth is certainly much easier to obtain. Now, this is creating completely new routes to consumer and completely new business models to factor into our customer activation strategies. So do we really know our consumers and do we know that they're looking for us or expect to find us in these types of services? And more importantly, within our clients, who actually owns a relationship with the likes of Deliveroo or Uber Eats? But our desire for speed and simplicity is also beginning to resonate with new and innovative solutions, which are all about instant gratification. Uh, it's now about the need to bring solutions and services to the customer, creating unique solutions that are highly mission and occasion focused. And this example here from uh, Le Corette is launched in the UK. It's the first fresh cocktail delivery service as a new way for consumers to order and enjoy prepared cocktails in less than an hour from their favorite bar. Again, the data derived can be deployed and refined, uh, ranging an assortment in the local stores, but also create new products while enhancing the on-trade experience. But we also know that personalization is becoming increasingly important to winning the consumer. But it's now more than simply knowing more about the consumer as a shopper. We need to know and become part of the consumer's life and lifestyle through tailored, customized solutions. 
This example from Unilever uh, with SkinZ provides people with the custom skincare solutions through a monthly subscription format that considers all parts of the consumer's lifestyle, such as nutrition, sleep, and exercise. So this type of relationship goes far beyond data to truly understanding the personal needs of the consumer by leveraging data from a variety of touch points. And this really is where we can actually start to understand those touch points. So, so the solutions such as the Unilever's are only really possible by combining data derived from multiple sources, which includes social listening to really understand your consumer needs. A huge element of the new rules of engagement is social commerce. Successful brands are beginning to place themselves in relevant content and conversations, engaging with shoppers in natural, unforced ways that begin to resonate. So generating engaging, relevant content for deployment on social media, either directly or indirectly, must become part of any marketing capabilities and budgets. Seeing the consumer as many influencers or active partner in social selling, influencer marketing is, of course, becoming a very popular way for brands to communicate more authentically through that spokesperson of their choosing. In fact, when we start thinking about social commerce, it's more than just a place to engage and influence. If we're looking and finding incremental growth with e-commerce, which is often one of the challenges for many clients, it's having the ability to instantly convert demand will become essential. Considering where consumers are most active and the need to streamline the path to purchase, making it friction-free, but no less experiential, we're going to certainly see this percentage of people using social platforms to buy directly from their favorite social media will certainly begin to rise. But how will the clients allocate social media platforms into their channel segmentation strategies? How will they begin to influence the influencers and ensure that customers can quickly check out from these types of platforms? But it's not more than just social commerce. It's more than just social platforms. We're beginning to see the fusion of instant retail and entertainment, creating in-moment instant gratification through solutions such as Watch, See, Buy initiatives. This one from Misguided, partner with the hit reality TV show uh, Love Island, to create those true micro moments, enabling those watching the show to instantly buy the outfits worn by the contestants. But that retailtainment is also beginning to manifest itself in new ways through new and exciting platforms. So the ability to create smart content that can be deployed across multiple channels and touch points is only half the challenge. You need to ensure you're empowering consumers, making them part of the brand messaging and storytelling. So do you know what consumers are doing with the content we're creating, how they're creating content about a brand and using it through platforms such as TikTok? So consumer-directed content and the ability to create short-form video and content-centric marketing that facilitates in-moment purchasing is becoming a key growth driver. So just to wrap up this sort of whistle-stop tour of some of the key drivers and trends that we're beginning to see, as we progress beyond omnichannel to a truly channel-less, consumer-centric environment, it will be more important to meet the consumers where they are and create distinctive new value while maintaining their existing retail relationships. D2C solutions will enable brands to create greater ownership of the consumer experience, creating more meaningful relationships while generating valuable data and insights that enhance how they go to market in retail. So that's it from me, but I'll uh, have to take any questions at the end of the webinar, but for now, I'll hand over to Andy, who will talk to us through uh, exactly how we can start to achieve D2C. Andy. Thank you, Malcolm. And, and yes, you, I should have said at the very start, um, if you do have questions to ask, please go in the chat box and put your questions in there. And then at the uh, end of the end of the webinar, Malcolm and I will uh, uh, attempt to answer those as best we can. I'm going to stay on this chart for just a moment. Um, it's quite uh, it's quite dense and complex and it's something we use to explain, as, as Malcolm said, the relationship between owned experiences and third party experiences. The part that I'm going to highlight is um, the three words in the middle, which are insights, engagement, and sales. Um, and particularly look at the difference between third party and, and first party or owned experience. We put what we believe the, 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 the central focus of value is at the top of those lists. So 
when it comes to third party, it's sales followed by engagement and insights. And when it comes to first party, it's really insights, engagement, and then sales. Um, something we're very keen to advocate to our clients is that um, if they can tap into each of these three pools of value, they'll end up creating experiences that are more valuable for their customers, more valuable for their partners, and more valuable for themselves. Um, and that means when they come to actually establish a D2C uh, platform or a series of programs, whether they be multi-program, CRM, their own, their own stores, whatever it may be, to be looking really to set themselves up to win by focusing on all three pools of value rather than one and not necessarily comparing the various differences in the various channels, but ensuring that each one leverages the other. So moving on from there um, and looking at, at, at the book itself. So we spent some time, myself and Zach uh, and Malcolm, really uh, thinking through how we could create something that was going to be digestible and usable that dealt with what we thought was the essential um, challenge that we were coming up with with clients when they would begin to talk um, about B2C experiences. Essentially, you know, as far as we were concerned, the inspiration and need for the book was born of the fact that often uh, client conversations begin with a question. And the question is, how do we harvest more margin for ourselves? Or how do we create a new channel? Or which technology should we deploy? Which platform should we deploy? And I think our sense of that was, and somewhat putting you know, the cart before the horse, because D2C isn't really a channel play, it's an experience play. And if you're going to really wade into D2C in any great depth, you have to really be thinking about obviously the customer experience, but also the organizational impacts that's going to have on your business. Um, and you also have to think about the impacts that's going to have on your existing business, namely your existing partners. So the book is really uh, aimed at squarely people who are looking at adding DVC into an already um, uh, already evolved supply chain of some description. Um, and we broke down what we thought the principles were that um, larger legacy brands could really consider um, into 23 principles, hence we called it DVC DNA because there are 23 chromosome pairs in in human cell. We thought it was um, uh, and that lined up neatly for us. We put in about 30 case studies um, and really highlighted some real world executions of where these principles come to life. And what I'm going to do um, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where we are, is is really um, quickly take you through those 23. I'm not going to drain them all and give you four examples where we think they really come to life um, based around these four uh, divisions and chapters that we, we have in the book. So the book really begins with first principles, which is essentially the mission mindset and importance of customer centrality and the mobile customer. And we kind of conclude that D2C capabilities are really a set of skills to be, to be developed that will serve the whole organization more than simply just being a business unit or um, a channel that you, you spin up in competition with other channels that you have. The DDC essentials are these essential skills, um, and they're the ones that help a brand develop an understanding of the value of data and detail in action, and how that really um, creates the lived experience of the brand. Um, we really talk about how uh, stories are so important, um, and experiences really develop customer advocacy. And as Malcolm was pointing out um, at the start there, you know, we're, we're not competing necessarily with, with other brands, we're competing with other experiences and other entertainment. So we need to really think about that as we develop brands going into the future. Um, for all of this to, to really make any sense and to come to life, you know, these experiences really are the outworkings of culture and a commitment to collaboration within the organization. And so we have a section really de devoted to the kinds of cultural um, traits and characteristics that a business needs to have if it's going to be truly D2C rather than just having uh, a buy button on a website. And then finally, we talk about how D2C brands go about broadening um, uh, their appeal and sustaining their growth. Not all of this will always have an implication for a legacy brand, but there's some quite interesting lessons, I think, that can be learned um, from uh, 
from from B to C brands and how they approach those things. So stepping forward, I am not going to drain this slide too densely. But when you get your download of the book, which will come uh, when we send the, the, the webinar details through to you, um, you'll have access to this slide here. And essentially, early on in the book, we decided to put a single page that captures the whole book, um, and that is that single page. Um, and so moving on, let's talk really about what the first principles are. And the first principles of, of B2C are B2C companies are generally missional in mindset. They are, they are on a mission, not merely to sell products, but actually to create new experiences that customers cleave to and they value. We believe that customers are buying missions, not, not just products. That infers the fact that B2C is a mindset and companies aren't only thinking about products, they're thinking about the whole market structure and how uh, they can address every element of the experience through a 21st century lens. And we have some great examples throughout the book of that and a couple that we'll talk about today. Um, B2C obviously begins and ends with C, in our opinion. Um, C obviously being the customer. Those customers are mobile and that changes everything, as Malcolm has pointed out in his setup. Um, and we conclude that B2C is a skill, not a channel. And by that, we mean it's a, it's a progressive capability that brands can set about developing. And it isn't something they naturally have if they already have a, a, a third party, third party retail structure. It's a unique set of skills that need to be um, understood, conceived and then, and then developed to address the customer, the customer need. So we, we, were, we thought that we would just talk about Patagonia and uh, some of their efforts in B2C as an example of a company that's clearly mission based and built on um, some of these first principles. And we're going to talk about very quickly two of the experiences that Patagonia has created. The first one is this experience, it's called Warnware. Uh, Warnware um, has been um, around for a couple of years now. Very simply put, Patagonia, um, um, Patagonia clothing lasts a very long time. Um, it tends to survive fashion and fashion trends. Um, Patagonia is also committed to upcycling and recycling every thread that they create. So they created this platform, Warnware, as a means to enable customers to do that. They, they appreciated that they had a specific position in the market, but they weren't necessarily helping customers to um, fulfill on the promise, which is to upcycle or recycle um, all of the thread. So they created the Warnware platform. As you can see from uh, some of the detail here, it's pretty simple. You uh, either take uh, a, an item into a store, if you're close to a Patagonia store, you drop it in the mail and send it to Patagonia. They will grade the product and either sell it, resell it, or they will um, uh, recycle it. That's their, that's their commitment to their customers. It's a standalone business within Patagonia. Um, it's a standalone platform that Patagonia has developed. And it's there to you know, provide, for a new provide not only a new capability, but also to introduce a new customer and, and validate and amplify the brand values that the, the company has. If you, uh, if you go to warmware.com, you can actually buy used, pre-used, pre-loved uh, Patagonia wear. And Patagonia has found such a great way to get someone who either can't afford to buy a lot of their clothing, but would like to, or people who are um, uh, looking to, 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 to add Patagonia to their collection. So warmware is a really great example. It obviously sits adjacent to their clothing business, but it's a, it's a distinct business unit within that. And then Patagonia Provisions has actually been around for somewhat longer. This has been around since 2012. Um, and the goal of Patagonia Provisions is to improve the supply chain of food. And as you can see from, from how they present their product, this is predominantly aimed at the kinds of people that would buy Patagonia clothing. Um, most of the food is either shelf stable or dried. Um, so it's great for backpacking. But progressively, more and more, you're starting to see um, some of these products turn up in people's kitchens for con consumption at home as well. Patagonia Provisions is a, uh, a fully independent business that sits within, um, uh, within Patagonia, but it has its own offices, its own marketing, its own team. And it exists to obviously amplify the broad mission of Patagonia, which is to um, look after the planet that we all live on. 
and it also exists to become um, a larger a larger business than the clothing business obviously they can sell more frequently more products to more people you can access the brand through a number of different um different means whether you're into fish or whether you're into um beer or, or whatever it may be um it's a great brand extension but more importantly it's a great d2c business that uh, patagonia has built uh, to really amplify and extend its mission and to do this they've had to develop a lot of skills that they didn't naturally necessarily have as they only have 30 or so stores of their own within the, within the us so we just thought patagonia offers a really good insight into how longer tenured brands can really begin to play effectively in this space when we think about the second section which is DVC essentials we're really thinking about those 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 two um, uh, aspects that Malcolm called out and that is the uh, collection and application and creation of really relevant useful detail and data that helps you build phenomenal customer experiences and then around those customer experiences how you build really good stories understanding that customers don't really buy products they buy experiences they buy stories they buy feelings and how those things then confer into long-term value and long-term loyalty. Um, and so we have this slightly controversial statement that B2C brands are, are not in it for the money. Um, they're, they're more really in it for the loyalty. I expect the, the, the money to follow the effective delivery of the value in the first place. Um, and that's something that D2C brands, probably funded by you know, a certain amount of capital, have, have some uh, uh, leverage to play with. But it's something that they very much focus on and make real. And it's something you can obviously do with a strong D2C connection. Our example um, uh, in this particular section, and we feature it widely in the book, is Frank Body. Frank Body is um, an Australian uh, uh, caffeine scrub business. They, they provide skin scrubs and, and shower scrubs. Um, and we're actually created at the inspiration of two customers of a coffee shop in Melbourne who came into the store one day asking for coffee because they wanted to use it as a body scrub. Um, and the founder was uh, uh, working in that coffee shop, handed over the coffee grains and got the idea that maybe there was a business there. And fast forward, you know, five or six years, they've now sold in 155 countries. They have 700,000 Instagram um, uh, followers. Uh, and sell about 20 to 30 million dollars worth of scrubs every single year. Frank Body really has focused, I think, on understanding what their customer looks for, focusing really clearly and closely on, on what their customer niche is, and also then focusing very, very hard on um, what their product setup is, what it means to scrub, where scrubs actually sit within the market, and then also how they bring that to market on their site using a lot of bundles, um, a lot of giftable packs, um, and how they then bring that to life with retail partners where they use a lot more grab and go, very, very different price pack architecture. Um, they use Amazon very heavily as a channel. Um, and the reason for that is not necessarily to drive sales, but to actually drive, um, uh, uh, to drive insight and engagement through reviews that they get on Amazon and also understanding search behavior on Amazon understanding how customers might choose another product versus their own, seeing how other products that are competitive to theirs are reviewed versus theirs and vice versa. They also use um, a lot of data that sits outside of their own, their own set of data to understand where net new product innovation comes from. An example of that is they've just launched a hair care range, which is a scalp scrub um, uh, and a face pack. And they use Google Trends and Google data to understand the lift in the number of people that were beginning to look for hair solutions with scrubs versus just conditioner and, and, and traditional shampoos. And so in May of this year, they launched into that market on the basis of that experience um, by having a closed sale and a closed setup on, on frankbody.com, seeing how much appetite there was for the product then bringing that to market and then later on this year they're going to move that into retail. I think another thing to really think about with Frank Body is not just their use of, of all available channels of R&D, but also their use of story. If you go onto YouTube and see the way that they use video, the way they use story on their own site. Um, they built a whole ritual into how you use their product. 
such that customers will get it. They'll do their scrub in the shower. Then they'll grab their um, uh, they'll grab their um, uh, they'll, they'll grab their their camera and then take a selfie of themselves and post it. It's a great way to kind of extend and, and develop the story with their customers over time. And finally, Frank Body really is a community. They're very very uh, close to um, their customer set. And the customer sets highly engaged with the brand, which helps them develop loyalty, um, helps them develop uh, new experiences, but also a sense of community amongst the people that follow them and the people that buy from them. So we feel that as small as a brand they are, and they're still really an emerging private brand, um, they're a brand that really does sit on this nexus of uh, uh, data, detail, and, and, and a well-told story. So moving to culture, all of, all, of, all of what we've discussed can only really happen if it's underpinned by culture. Culture is, is, is the means by which we um, have an appetite to create these experiences and, and um, uh, set about knowing that we're actually creating what we're, what, what we're setting out to achieve. And we start with a slightly um, provocative statement that DDC brands are unorganized. And by that, we don't mean that they are disorganized merely that they are organized in such a way that you see the through line for the whole customer experience. The way you do that is to collaborate internally, uh, externally with, with marketing and distribution partners, manufacturing partners, um, and obviously uh, uh, look to um, have, a, have a curious mindset around what's going on in the market, but also how you can help your partners um, deliver to you the products that your customers are asking for. Um, so the culture that you find within D2C brands is, is, is really a culture driven by the through lines of the customer experience rather than the reporting lines of, of, of a functional organization. We believe that D2C brands are in essence simplifiers, and we see that show up in lots of places, and I'm going to talk about the example of care of momentarily, which um, I think really leans into that. And obviously, they can be opportunists. They can move very fast to experiment with new ways to generate demand um, and with new products and small sample and batch sizes. Most importantly, because their brands are uh, somewhat frail, they, uh, they, they determine useful promises to, to make and to keep, and then they keep them. Um, and we tend to see that, that DDC brands can be very, very tight around their mission, and they aren't going to stray that far away from it because they don't want to make promises that they can't keep. All of this obviously is predicated on the fact that you have to be able to move fast to correct problems that you create, but also to take opportunities as they present themselves. Um, and our example uh, that we're going to talk about a little bit here is Care Of, which is um, a vitamin company. Um, the, the slide you actually have up now is, is one you're probably all familiar with that view of what the vitamin aisle currently looks like. And Care Of set out to completely simplify that vitamin aisle um, and bring transparency um, uh, to the marketplace. And they did that by creating um, a 55 question questionnaire, which you, you, you uh, complete online, either on the phone or, or on desktop. And the questionnaire really asks you uh, questions in three categories, who you are, how you live, and who you want to be. Um, and in answering those questions, they're able to provide for you personalized recommendations for, um, uh, for vitamins that you would take on a daily, on a daily basis. To back that up, they provide you with, with what is effectively a grown-up Pez dispenser. Every month, you get um, 30 packs of the vitamin <clears throat> prescription that you've essentially prescribed for yourself, which makes it very easy to maintain the protocol, to comply, um, and to use uh, use the product and not just have them build up and, and forget, you know, get lost and forgotten in the, in the shelf of the pantry. Um, However, the, the, one of the things we find most interesting about this is the questionnaire, the, the, the dual purpose and the dual effect of the questionnaire. Um, you know, intuitively, a 55 uh, question questionnaire to commence um, a, a relationship online seems really long. But what um, Carol found was that if, if, if you get customers to commit the time to take the questionnaire, it takes about five or six minutes. They tend to really believe and, and enjoy the recommendations that you make. And they start to understand why those recommendations are there and begin to make choices about uh, which ones to take and maybe which ones to forfeit and in which direction. So they've created a real relationship with the customer through the questionnaire, which binds the customer to 
um, to the business. And the second thing that's really interesting about the questionnaire, of course, is that it gives um, uh, gives care of really advance warning and notice of trends in um, in the marketplace uh, in, in your minerals and various other ingredients that people are looking you know for more of, as well as um, uh, you know states of being and states of mind that people are concerned about, either they have too little of or, or they want to have more of. So for example, one of the questions is asking you what your alcohol intake is. And from that, they can make all kinds of determinations as to how seriously people are taking different kinds of conditions and where the market is moving to. And that has enabled them to really get a head start on, on, on the market through very direct first party data. And then because it is difficult and challenging to source uh, products um, at scale and sustainably and get enough of an early warning to really get into the marketplace to find the products um, that, uh, that customers are demanding and asking for. So Kerov began as a vitamin company. They've since added supplements such as proteins. And they also have added a range of products called Quick Sticks, which um, are really grab and go, on the go um, shots of a given supplement. So melatonin is a very popular one if you struggle with sleep. And obviously energy is the is the flip side of that um, so they've been able to build their business you know step by step really on the basis of, of genuine direct customer feedback and around that they've built a a quirky warm generous spirited brand that people like to engage with keep informed and keep up to date with and they've created a new way to um, take and receive you know vitamins that is engaging fun um and um, uh, and, and, and really just burst the bubble on, on the old way of doing things. So whilst it's really hard to look at a business uh, culturally from the outside in, we have a sense that the culture within, um, within Care Of is combining to create this um, very personal, but also very spirited and very um, uh, aware, uh, aware business that, uh, that Care Of has. So finally, I'm going to talk about growing and sustaining the business. And there are three elements to this. You know, how do you grow through Digitale, which is a combination of um, your own digital experiences and detail? Um, can you grow with partnerships? A lot of brands are growing with partnerships. And how do you manage your marketing costs? And what's the relationship of, of um, uh, customer acquisition costs to, to lifetime value? Um, the example I'm going to use here is, is Dirty Lemon. Dirty Lemon is, is um, the first brand from uh, a company called Iris Nova. Iris Nova is uh, Latin for new lens. And that's a pretty, a pretty apt name for uh, a DTC only brand that is looking to, uh, to build direct relationships with customers because they're looking at the beverage industry with a completely new lens. They're looking at it uh, in terms of speed to market and creating blends of products that can come to market within 30 days and not within months. Um, looking at distribution models that go direct to consumer so that consumers can um, uh, purchase and consume those quickly. Um, and also looking at partnerships that are, that are uh, discovery partnerships, not just, um, not just volume, volume partnerships. The beverage industry is a distribution game based typically on volume. And um, Iris Nova is really coming at that with a, with a somewhat different lens. Briefly put, the drinks are um, about $10 to $11 each for a single 16-ounce bottle. They typically contain um, ingredients that will help you uh, detox or will help add energy or you can add to your, part, add, add to your life as a means of, of refreshing yourself more than beyond just mere hydration. Uh, they're very high-end, very premium drinks, as you can tell by the price point, um, and they appeal to a, 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 you know, a very specific millennial consumer. Um, but we just think this platform that they're building is, is a platform for growth. And it's predicated on the idea that um, the founder, Zach Normandin, doesn't believe that, that the future of beverages is four or five billion dollar brands. He thinks the future of beverages is 40 or 50, 100 million dollar brands. And those 100 million dollar brands will grow and wither and die in very, very rapid succession. And the goal of the business is to create literally a platform, a system, to create experiences, products, and distribution that um, sits outside of the standard distribution network around beverages. 
they're going about their growth and their distribution in, in two or three quite interesting ways. The first way is they have a, they're building a retail network of wholly owned stores. And these stores are, are quite unique because um, they, um, uh, they feature a cashierless checkout uh, honor system. So when you go into the store, um, you, you pull out a drink from one of the chiller cabinets and you send a text message to, um, uh, to, to Dirty Lemon uh, telling them what you took and and then and then you pay through text message so you, you register your credit card once and you pay through text message it's a complete honor system uh, there's no cashier there to, to check that you're actually paying um and it, it as you can see it's a pretty instagram worthy environment as well their hypothesis is that most people will pay and they're seeing that between 90 and 95 percent of people will pay for the drink um and then when they do, they'll they'll uh, they'll make a statement through their social accounts so and just been into um, uh, just been into a dirty lemon store. Dirty lemon is also using collaborations with Soho House and a, a bunch of other um, places to actually act as discovery hubs for the drink. And the goal not necessarily to create high volume, but to create discovery, which um, brings customers back to Dirty Lemon's own website where they can buy again. You don't check out through um, uh, through a normal checkout. You check out through text message. But they're also using Amazon, which is quite interesting. Um, and they've, they've signed into the Prime program, so they're using Amazon um, uh, uh, Prime, and they're they're using the seller fulfilled program. So they're fulfilling everything themselves direct rather than using fulfillment by Amazon, which gives them you know, more of a take on the data than you might get otherwise on Amazon. But particularly, it gives them location data. They know where they, they may not know, you know, exactly who the customer is as they do in their own stores, but they know where the customer is. So as they look to grow and to, and to develop their business, they're using Amazon as a platform to teach them where their potential next customer is. Um, they're going to be opening stores in Miami, Chicago, um, as well as the West Coast, and obviously more in New York. Um, so we just felt that Dirty Lemon was a really interesting brand um, when it came to improving and, and changing the game and also enhancing distribution. Um, and recently, Coke led a $15 million round um, of investment into Dirty Lemon because they really want to see how this hypothesis is going to grow. And whilst uh, Dirty Lemon might, may get some benefit from distribution from Coke, I think Coke also see the opportunity to see how speed is going to influence the beverage industry over time. So we love this example. We think they're just doing some really interesting and innovative things. Um, now, the final word, and I'm not going to drain this too much, but the final word on, um, on D2C, especially for legacy brands, is actually typically the first word that we give clients. And the first word we give them is, when you're getting the D2C, first do no harm. Um, we think that a bad D2C experience can actually harm um, your brand. We can get will harm uh, the customer by creating confusion about pricing and availability across channels. We obviously think it can harm channel relationships by creating conflict and create internal tensions in the organization. And it's hard to be profitable at D2C at the outset um, and until you've generated some scale. So our first piece of advice is going to be my last word today, which is, um, whatever you do when you build DDC, build it with insights, engagement, um, and fulfillment and sales in mind, but principally insight and engagement. And build it in such a way that enhances and not harms your existing business and your existing relationships. So my five takeaways are DDC is a customer experience. You have to think about designing your experience um, and marketing it beyond the product and looking at the totality of the experience. Delight in detail. Don't, don't believe that the devil is there. You know, data and feedback is your friend, and you want more of it from more sources that you can possibly get. And that's going to require you to refresh and revamp the infrastructure in your business and your corporate culture. And again, finally, do no harm. And so with that done, thank you very much for, for hearing me out. Um, we can move to q and um, I'll quickly jump in. So Alexandra um, asked the question, uh, we used um, Frank Body as an example of DDC, but then we talk about the partnership with Amazon as an insight generator. Um, and so the question is, is Amazon considered a DDC play? Uh, and so the, the, the short answer to that is it's, it's considered part of the ecosystem. 
um, and a very valuable part of the ecosystem. And principally for, for Frank Body, um, one of the things that they lean into is how valuable it is as an insight generator, um, because they use it for that purpose. And clearly it, it helps drive volume as well. But it's a game that, that um, uh, you know, Frank Body felt they wanted to be in because that's where a lot of product searches occur. And so the way to see Amazon is not necessarily to see it as a, as a competitor, um, uh, but actually to see it as an, as an opportunity if it's used the right way. Um, and Dirty Lemon is doing a very, very similar thing. Um, hence, we kind of highlighted, highlighted that example as well. Um, approach Amazon with care and caution, but also approach it as an opportunity. Malcolm, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're right to say are they a friend or foe um, approach cautiously to begin with and, and be mindful of how they're going to use that data. But I certainly think it's Amazon is becoming increasingly more than just a platform to sell through. It's becoming a platform as a, as a media platform and an advertising platform. And as it increasingly gets more and more eyeballs and traffic, it is obviously is a great way to gain more visibility and discoverability, which will then drive traffic um, also to their direct to consumer channels. Uh, and Amazon are also giving a lot more um, power, a lot more tools that are usually reserved for first party sellers. Um, so that I think those kind of tools and access will certainly see a lot more uh, growth coming from third party sellers. So it's obviously more digital native brands going through, um, through, through Amazon, not just as a media platform, but also as a sales channel. That's right. As we, as we, as we um, were interviewing um, founders and executives at some of these companies, we were interested to hear how um, uh, thoughtful many of them were um, about their relationships with retailers generally, um, but specifically Amazon. Um, I think part of that is also driven by the increased cost in um, uh, marketing platforms like Facebook and, and Instagram. A lot of these founders are now looking for other cost-effective partnerships that can introduce them to a new customer that they can then render loyal. Um, and hence, Amazon is becoming, you know, as you say, for that whole uh, basket of reasons, it's becoming um, a, a consideration for them. At this point, we don't have any more questions on the chat. Um, I hope that was uh, useful. As, as we said, it's a uh, uh, it, it's a it's, it's a quick read the book, but we hope that the um, uh, uh, the traits and characteristics and operating principles we've outlined resonate with you. Myself and Malcolm can be contacted um, on, on our email addresses, obviously, for more information about the book and anything that we presented in this webinar. Um, uh, shortly, you'll be receiving um, uh, a live replay of the webinar and a link to download the book. And if you have any questions about it then please feel free to contact Malcolm and myself directly. We're more than happy to um, answer them for you. And of course, we'll be um, uh, happy to uh, present this information uh, within uh, any setting that you, you feel would be helpful to you. One last question from, from Alexandra. Um, I'm gonna ask Malcolm to answer this question because uh, uh, you have a much, I think a much stronger perspective necessarily than me, but um, are there any global FMCG brands you think are doing B2C particularly well now? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I think there are, but they're doing it in very different ways. Um, and I think the, the main way is to really start to gather more and more data to truly understand their questions mm -hmm. and how the consumer is behaving. Uh, I think if you start to look at Pepsi, for example, with their Pepsi Home, uh, that's sort of leveraging more environmental um, sort of conscientious consumer with their capsules and the sort of soda stream and you have some great examples there from unilever that we talked about today which is leveraging data to create truly compelling differentiated experiences um, and gatorade again a great example of a brand who's beginning to really deliver something unique and differentiated from their retail experience uh, and even some of the big fashion brands such as nike who are beginning to really truly own uh, their relationship with the consumer through social platforms and so it, there are lots of different examples, and many of them in, in the book itself, which really start to highlight that. Good stuff. Okay, well, um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, that was, uh, uh, it was great to see such a, uh, uh, an audience. And 
as we say, we'll look forward to getting this out to you and we'll give you back nine, more, nine or so minutes of your time and look forward to hearing from you directly if you have more questions. And do contact us if you would like us to present this information uh, to a group of your company. Thank you. Thank you very much.